wonderful morning it is to be in the house of the Lord. We have some announcements to go through. Um, in your pews, you'll see a light blue colored card. It's a prayer request card. If you or someone you know needs to be lifted up in prayer, just take this card, fill it out, put it in the offering plate as it makes its way around. We have a group of people who come together to pray specifically over your request. Also, the Days for Girls Project Group will meet in room 13 on Wednesday, May 25th, instead of Wednesday, May 18th. So if you're a part of that, uh, it won't be this week. It'll be the following week, the following Wednesday. The United Methodist Men is having a meeting tomorrow at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. That is open to all <coughs> men who are here. You don't have to be a member of a church. You don't have to be a member of the United Methodist Men. Um, just come to the Fellowship Hall, 6.30 uh, tomorrow, and you'll get to meet some of the guys who are sitting uh, here this morning. And we would be more than happy to have you. And those are our announcements for this morning.
know this person's name. Ellen Cottrell was a part of our church. She's lived the past few years in North Carolina, but she passed away and went to the board uh, Friday on May uh, 13th. So we don't keep our family members in in uh, mind and in our prayers, our thoughts and prayers, as uh, you know they are going through the grieving process. Ellen Cottrell was a wonderful lady and uh, a good part of our our uh, body of believers here at First United Methodist. And let's remember also those who are at home recuperating and undergoing treatment, those in convalescent centers, rehabilitation centers, hospice, or in private care. Let's go to our Heavenly Father this morning in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful day you have given us to be in the house of the Lord. By your hand, we are here. And we're here for one purpose, one purpose only, to praise the name of Jesus. We invite your Holy Spirit to teach us that, to lead us in that, that we may praise you. For you are a God who is worthy of our praise and so much more. And Heavenly Father, because of who you are and everything you are about, we cannot deny the simple fact that we have been blessed every day. And Heavenly Father, we lift up some of those blessings for you this morning. We thank you for this great country that we live in. We pray for our president and governor and mayor, and also those men and women who make decisions for us. We pray for our military, those who have served, those who are serving, because we have been blessed by their service. And Heavenly Father, we lift up to you uh, the Cottrell family as they go through the grieving process, as you have welcomed Ellen home to your kingdom. We also uh, pray for Linda Austin as she is going through much uh, physical ailments. And Lord, that you will give the doctors uh, some wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as they treat her. Bring healing to her body, Lord, physically, and Lord, always spiritually. May she continue to draw closer to you. We also want to pray for those who are at home for recuperating, for undergoing treatment, those in convalescent centers, rehabilitation centers, hospice, or in private care, those who are going through difficult times financially, or those who are going through difficult times with relationships in the family unit. Lord, we just pray you know the need of each and every one of us, and sometimes we don't ever mention it to anyone other than you. But Lord, we lift those up to you as a congregation this morning, because we are a congregation that needs to be dependent on you. And Lord, this is one way that we can show it, by asking you, Lord, for the things that we need. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for this church and its many facets of ministries. We pray for our children, our youth, and our adult ministries. May we continue to desire to be disciples, to walk in your path. We thank you for our pastor and his family. We pray for your hand. Lord, to continue to be upon them as we have been blessed by their service. And Heavenly Father, most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ who went to the cross and bore our pain and our shame. And Lord, we thank you for the word that he spoke because we read it and hopefully read it every day and allow it to be written in our hearts. From Genesis to the end of Revelation, Jesus Christ is the word of truth, as it says in John 1.1. 1, 1. And that that word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So we can believe and rely on the trustworthiness of the word of God. And may it so ever be written in our hearts. May we remember many of his teachings. And one of the teachings, Lord, when a disciple of Christ came to Jesus and said, Lord, how should we pray? And Jesus said to that disciple and to the others who were there, When you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
We would like to invite the ushers forward as we receive this morning's tithes, offerings, and gifts. <coughs> Passed the cup among them. 
every month we remember Jesus' words in the distribution of what we call the Last Supper, Holy Communion. But we never get to these verses each month. A new command I give you, love one another. But before Jesus says that, he says that the Son of Man is glorified. Now is the Son of Man glorified. How is the Son of Man, Jesus, glorified? First by his life. Theologically, we subscribe to the belief that Jesus lived a perfect life. It's why Jesus was able to offer himself upon the cross, a penalty for our sins, because he had none of his own for which to be put to death. That's hard for most of us to wrap our minds around. A perfect life. Would we like to have lived a perfect life? A life without error? A life without sin? That's not the reality for us. I don't want to pick and choose who I throw under the bus with this because in Romans Paul tells us for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That was true then and it's true now. All have sinned. I don't want to burst anyone's bubble this morning that you thought we had it all together. Um, but all have sinned. All except Jesus. In Luke, right after Jesus was reunited with his family, after he was, right after his bar mitzvah journey, as we think of it, as I think of it, um, to Jerusalem, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Jesus lived before he began his ministry. He lived and worked. All of us have lived and worked. Our jobs as children consisted of chores, things to do around the house. Jesus did those kinds of things. We suspect that he helped his father in the carpentry business. And It was probably the business of a builder rather than carpenter. It's the same word in the Greek, and so we don't we're not able to distinguish whether Jesus was a woodworker or a stone worker or a builder. But today certainly in Israel, there aren't a lot of trees. The Ottomans, as they were retreating, destroyed as many of the trees as they could. And so what we have today isn't necessarily what they had in Jesus' day. But one thing they have had a plenty then and now is rocks. You, stone was everywhere. And quarries were um, very much part of Israel. And so 
much was built out of stone. And I suspect that I don't want to burst anyone's bubble or, or ruin anyone's image of Jesus if we're picturing, you know, kind of hammering nails. But um, nails didn't exist back then. So just, just a thought. But Jesus had a life. He lived. <coughs> And did everyday ordinary things that people do as part of life. And yet he did it all without sin. Now is the Son of Man glorified. How is he glorified? He is glorified in his life. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's a bar that's so high above us that pole vaulting or rockets can't get us over the top. But we can strive for perfection in love. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, or co-founder of Methodism, if you want to give Charles equal billing, uh, his brother, but John Wesley, in trying to figure out how are we going to pursue perfection, how, as mere mortals, can we strive for perfection? And the answer is, we can strive for perfection in love. To love one another. That's what Jesus commanded us to do. To love one another as I have loved you. So Jesus was an example of love in the way in which he dealt with his disciples. Jesus was an example of love that we need to follow. It's not an easy option. It's not automatic. Some people are more lovable than others. All of us know people that it's just easy to love them, to because almost always there are people who are very loving. People who are not so loving. <laughs> are often much more difficult to love. The prickly pair of people that you just, you know, you try to tell them, have a good day, what's good about it? <laughs> you know, it's just, you, you, you work with that and get around as best you can, but it's just sometimes hard. There are a lot of people who don't know how to give or receive love. Who were called to do it nevertheless. And we should all, everyone, all of us, who call ourselves Christian, by whatever banner we are under, United Methodist, Baptist, varieties of Baptists, um, Christian, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Catholic, if we call ourselves Christian, we should be known by our love. That's not so much the case.
there has been a lot of hurt done in the name of Christ. Ireland still struggles with the Catholics and Protestants. They would argue that it's not a religious thing, it's a political thing. <laughs> but it's in the name of Christ that it's kind of hard for us over here to separate them in our minds when people are fighting ostensibly as Christians who are instructed to love one another. It's not love the people in your circle. That's where it's got to start. We've got to love one another. But it's got to go beyond that. It should extend to all Christians. Regardless of whether we agree with their positions on things or not. We're called to love. And that's what all of us should be striving for all of the time. To love one another as Jesus loves us. As we're loved, we need to love. And it needs to just be a part of our DNA as Christians. It can only be a part of our DNA as Christians if we have Christ first in our hearts. That's where it comes from. It's not something we generate out of effort. I'm going to love everyone today. No, it's I am loved and I'm just going to open myself to that everywhere I can in every way I can. sometimes is that we lump people into groups and whether it's ideological or um, nationality or skin tone or anything else that you can lump people together in it's hard to love others when you see them as a group when you see them as as us and them. But we've got to find ways of loving the thems certainly as individuals. The United Methodist Church has said for years that all people are of sacred worth. But I'm not sure we've always believed that. Everyone who agrees with us is of sacred worth. <laughs> but not always everyone that disagrees with us or that doesn't look like us or that doesn't vote like us. We're called to love regardless of the labels and banners 
we're called to love people. And that's something that we should be striving for every day and every way. Do you realize that you won't meet anyone today, tomorrow, or the rest of your life who isn't someone that God loves? There isn't anybody that God doesn't love. And we are called to love them as God has loved us. If we've accepted the love of Christ into our hearts, then we've got to extend that love to others. It doesn't mean that we're going to suddenly agree with everyone else. We're just called to love as we have been loved. By that, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If in any one church around the world, if we could just do what Jesus has called us to do, it would get noticed. People would be like, what's going on with that church? Why, they're just loving everyone. How is Christ glorifying? Christ was glorifying his death. Jesus spoke these words hours ahead being placed on the cross. That's the context. After supper, the teaching of the disciples, the garden of Gethsemane, Pilate, and Herod, and the cross. It's all this night. As Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. And he tells them, in the midst of this, that he is going away. And they can't follow where he's going. Jesus went to the cross. For us. Not the us us here, not the us us watching. He went to the cross for people. That we might be forgiven. We are called to follow him with the love as he loved us. Jesus loved to his last breath. And we are called to love as long as we have breath. Scripture doesn't tell us what happened to all of the disciples. It ends in the book of Acts with Paul awaiting judgment in Rome. Tradition teaches us that in about 66 AD, Paul was beheaded for his faith. Peter is said to have been crucified upside down. They offered to crucify him right side up, and he is said to have said that he didn't deserve to be crucified as his Lord did, and so they they turned him upside down and crucified. 
Some were stung. Thomas is said to have been stabbed to death by soldiers. All but John died for their faith violently. Those were among those who listened to Jesus. Love as I have loved you. We're not asked to give our lives for Christ. But we're called to give our lives for Christ. Dear Jesus, if there's anyone listening who, who hasn't invited you into their heart, Lord, come to that heart this day. Fill us all with your love. Fill us to overflowing. Crown him with many crowns. Stand as we're able to sing together. Three, two, seven. 